So a guy goes into a bar to ask his buddy for a loan. I asked him for three thousand. He says twenty five hundred, but it was three thousand. Don't let him, uh, don't let him lie to you. Lending money to friends is not a, always a good thing, especially when the mooch says right up front that this would be no ordinary loan. And I said, well, I'm not going to pay you back. And then he started getting a little upset. <laughs> The mooch knew something his buddy didn't know. Before too long, $3,000 would be pocket change. We were just kind of looking around, like every once in a while, I was like, we're millionaires. This is the amazing true life story of the long road to riches for the most unlikely crowd of millionaires you'll ever meet. Cheers, Good boys! Boy, millionaires! They were like seven guys who were just down to earth guys and were about to have a lot of fun. I would have loved to be with them that night. So you did seven, eight, nine, ten years ago. I would have been in Vegas blowing a whole lot of money probably. <laughs> but, uh... It's also the story of a family who might have won a jackpot that belonged to someone else. I don't want to discuss anything further. So I I'm finished with everything. Good evening, I'm Lyndon McIntyre. It's a mystery story wrapped in a mystery that won't be fully solved for maybe another year. But here's what we have for now. Someone collects a huge lottery prize that really belongs to somebody else. How that happened is something that the courts will decide eventually. But the really amazing part of the story is how the money after seven years ended up in the hands and pockets of seven ordinary guys who for all that time didn't have a clue that one day they'd be rich. For the newly wealthy, there's nothing like a round of golf to keep you humble. They've been hanging out together for years, working hard to earn their money and playing hard at spending it. That's more fun. Hockey slap shot and a golf <laughs> shot, but hey, it worked for you. Now, with easy money in their pockets, unmistakable reminders that not much else has changed. What do you mean we're aiming the wrong way? Over there. Even golf can't spoil the fun for these guys. Jim Riemann. We haven't really changed. We're all just the same guys. and Nobody goes, walks around acting like they're all that or anything. You know, it's... We're just, we're just seven guys that happen to be lucky enough to win the lottery. You're still buying tickets. Yeah. <laughs> of all people, we should believe. <laughs> if, any, if anybody says nobody wins that, they're, they're wrong. Because <laughs> you guys didn't just win. Yeah. You won in an amazing fashion. Yeah. Yeah, we beat the odds in every way. It all starts with a lotto ticket, Christmas 2003. At a convenience store in St. Catharines, Ontario, someone buys what's called a Super 7 Random Quick Pick. Days later, that Quick Pick ticket is checked a half hour away in Burlington. And happy day. It wins a free ticket for a big draw just days away. Boxing Day 2003. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, today's the day. Come in and save, save, save. But for millions in Ontario, the Boxing Day bargains weren't half as enticing as the lottery that would make someone richer by twelve and a half million dollars. The balls of destiny tumble, and after that Boxing Day draw, a woman telephones the OLG and claims the prize for her brother. Hello? Owner of the winning ticket, she says. It sounds straightforward, but more than eight years later, a lot of people are still dealing with the fallout from that phone call. February 5th, 2004. The woman caller, Kathleen Chung, shows up at the OLG, but now she claims to be the owner of the winning ticket. You have a winning ticket. Yeah. Let's see what you got. What she's got besides the ticket is a confusing story. Her brother? She says she doesn't have a brother. She just made that up to protect herself. 
She's surprisingly vague about where and when she bought that first ticket, the one that got her the freebie that now seems to have hit the jackpot. She would eventually admit that she had a brother after all, and that he was the manager of the store the winning ticket came from, and her father worked there too, all of which made the OLG investigators leery. All this was above board, she assured them. Suspicious OLG investigators say they asked her to take a lie detector test and that she agreed, but later, on reflection, she refused. The people at the OLG prize office were sure that there was something fishy about her story and they stalled her for a year. There were too many blank spots and contradictions, lies even. She really did have a brother, and he was the manager of that store that validated her winning ticket. In the end, the OLG surrendered, paid out the $12.5 million. As one official put it elegantly in an internal memo, sometimes you hold your nose. So what do you do when you're suddenly carrying 12 and a half big ones in your purse? Kathleen did what any sensible person would do. She went shopping. A $2 million mansion that backed onto a golf course. Eye-popping jewelry, clothes, a little fleet of fancy cars. Out in the real world, life went on. People working for a living, dreaming the dream. Buying lotto tickets every week. Always a long shot. But isn't that what faith is? A gamble? But sometimes faith can be misplaced. And for a little band of working men in southern Ontario, the lotto, Boxing Day 2003, would be a priceless lesson in the complexity of human nature. By 2006, the OLG thought they'd put the fishy Kathleen Chung jackpot behind them. They'd moved on. Then a scandal that would bring it back and more. Tonight on the Fifth Estate, it's the lottery fiasco that got Canada talking. A lotto optimist named Bob Edmonds told the Fifth Estate that he'd won a quarter of a million on a lotto ticket, but that someone ripped him off. Bob was pretty typical of lotto buyers. Small town, modest means, and high hopes. Always bought his tickets in the same convenience store. With his help, we'd discover a major weakness in the lotto system, the ease with which a crooked storekeeper could scam trusting folk like Bob Edmonds. His story set off shockwaves of suspicion about lotteries across the country. Ontario's ombudsman, Andre Marin, started investigating lotto wins in early 2007. So this investigation started you know, after, we viewed the, after I viewed the show and was sufficiently alarmed and threw everything in motion. And within a matter of 90 days, we found tens of millions of dollars, essentially, uh, missing in very suspicious circumstances. So you know, it was shocking for us to learn that this could happen in 2007 in the provincial government. You don't ask any questions. Among the most shocking cases in the file, that $12.5 million jackpot from Boxing Day. The, the lady who claimed the ticket claimed no affiliation with the uh, retailer. Um, A lie. Misrepresented herself. The OLG had very serious suspicion that uh, because they knew that the last name was the same, that she was uh, related and therefore may not be the bona fide winner, and simply let the time elapse and wrote a $12.5 million check. It's astounding. So to me, that was, it was indicative of an organization that was rotting and that needed a torpedo. And the torpedo was uh, the very public report that we, uh, that we made on the OLG. And the warhead was this particularly egregious $12.5 million. That's correct. David Kaplan was the Ontario Minister for Lotteries and he quickly promised action on the Ombudsman's report. Make no mistake, there will be no delay in implementing and moving forward on these recommendations. He handed over a number of fishy lotto files to the Ontario Provincial Police. One of them, just guess. In 2007, the Ontario Provincial Police were investigating the case and questioned Kathleen Chung. 
That same year, the family would also meet with the Fifth Estate, as we were investigating this case too. Producers met informally with her father, Jun Chol Chung, at a coffee shop and tried to clear up contradictions in her early stories to the OLG. He didn't realize that we were recording the meeting. I'll just read slowly. Okay, presented to the prize office February 5th, 2004. Did not identify affiliation with retail. So that's saying um, that she did not explain that her brother owns or managed the store and didn't explain that you worked at the store. And then how did they find out? They this, have this, ways this is to something find out. wrong. You're saying that's incorrect. Incorrect. But they're lying. That's right. Call this guy typical. Buys lotto tickets for his buddies, six of them. They work construction all over southern Ontario, but are as close as brothers. Every week for years, they pooled their money and trusted this guy with the task of finding them a winner. Dan Campbell. My buying habit was only one store is going to sell the winning ticket, so buy from as many stores as you can, which apparently works. <laughs> When we come back, a dying woman's intuition. She was lethargic, but she sat up and looked at me and said, Call, it's your money. Good evening, everyone. Three members of a GTA family have been charged with fraud, accused of stealing a winning lottery ticket worth $12.5 million. September 2010, Jun Chol Chung, father of Kathleen Chung, and her brother Kenneth, all three charged with fraud and money laundering over that free ticket that was validated in this store seven years before. That free ticket was taken. So the person that played up till that point is the person we need to find. They didn't get their free ticket. Somebody else got it and cashed it. Years had elapsed. Someone among the millions of lotto players in Ontario won big late in 2003 and didn't know it. Now the word was out, and with $12.5 million on the line, there would be a lot of interest. How did you find out that there was a mystery ticket out there? I just heard about it on the news, read it in the paper, that kind of thing. His cool response to the tantalizing news was far from typical. Hundreds of lotto players imagined the mystery ticket belonged to them. The OLG prize office was swamped with calls. Good morning, this is Betty speaking. How may I help you? Answer the questions and I'll just go through them. What I'll be doing today is going through a series of questions. I'll be documenting the information that you provide today, and that information will be forwarded along with this call to a member of the Ontario Provincial Police. Lisa Bolduc is an investigator with the OLG. You get a bunch of those phone calls. Yes. What, what, was, what were the phone calls like? You know what? It was actually really exciting to take those calls. I honestly, every time, every time I talked to a customer, I thought, oh, I wonder if this is the winner. We took in 661 calls. There were a small group of us taking the calls, and it was busy. I it bet. was busy. <laughs> it was a busy time. All the validations, activations, it's at a click right now. The OLG had come a long way in a few years after being wrapped on the knuckles by the Ontario Ombudsman in 2007. They had developed sophisticated ways of monitoring ticket sales. By 2010, they had a special computer program called DART for tracking tickets and ticket buyers with uncanny accuracy. DART gives instant access to billions of lottery transactions going back to 1999. Rick Guzzo invented DART. We identify and we have the capabilities now with DART to go in and spend more time analyzing and detect any fraudulent behavior. The Ontario lottery processes more than 1.2 billion tickets a year. Every ticket anybody buys can be linked to every other ticket that person purchases. 
Tickets have identities, and through them, people who buy tickets regularly create patterns that are revealing about the buyers. We have customers that play a lot of tickets. So for a customer that maybe purchases one ticket the odd time, it's harder to build a large profile. But if you have a customer that's purchasing, say, multiple tickets or purchasing over an extended period of time, it helps us build a, a more robust profile on the customer. We'll start on June 24th and we'll start with the validation of that ticket. So at 922.21, there is a purchase of a Lotto 649. Maybe I'll start with the location. This location can be one color, oh. just to separate them yes. out. Rick and Lisa were able to connect hundreds of tickets that were related to the one that scored the $12.5 million prize, and over time, discovered a purchase pattern that told them almost everything except the buyer's name. We know that he definitely had uh, a unique spending habit. We also know that he lived in a, city, a specific city and probably worked in another city. And that would be reflective of the times of days and days of the week that uh, he was purchasing and validating his tickets. So all these people who regularly buy tickets are leaving footprints and fingerprints everywhere they buy a ticket. Yes. And you can follow the footprints back to wherever in order to prove whether it's their ticket or not. It's, that, it's that simple. Correct. It's a work from home day today. It's perfect. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think... I find it's way easier to concentrate. Rick and Lisa, in one weekend working from their homes, designed the questions that would screen out the bogus claimants for the $12.5 million. What questions do you think will help prompt those answers to come out? And these are kind of generic questions? Yeah. If I called you up and said, I hear there's a $12.5 million ticket floating around, I think it's mine. What's the first thing you'd ask me? I would start uh, trying to ask where you do your purchases. How often do you attend that location? How much money do you spend? Do you generally validate your ticket? It's uh, a profile, and the more information you have, the uh, easier the decisions are to be made. Because you know the answers you're supposed to hear from me. Yes. And if I didn't give you the right answer, I'm out. Yes. At the OLG call center in Sault Ste. Marie, the calls went on for weeks, then slowed to a trickle. The year 2010 was running down. The mystery was turning into a conundrum. Then one of those eerie plot twists that just leaves you wondering about things like fate and destiny. A woman terminally ill with cancer emerges from a semi-coma with a peculiar message for her brother, Dan Campbell. When we went in, they had, the nurses said that she was medicated, so she would be in and out and that, and just to talk about She amongst, was pretty seriously ill. Yes, she was. Um, and to just um, talk amongst ourselves, and when she was uh, able, she'd jump in and out of the conversation. So she was lethargic, but she sat up and looked at me and said, call, it's your money. She was between life and death, and she seemed to know something about the future. Yeah, yeah. We were leaving. I uh, went and gave her a hug, told her I loved her, and I'd see her again. That was on a Friday. I said I'd be back either Sunday or Monday, and then uh, she'd said it again. She said, make sure you call. It's your money. And then uh, later that night, early Saturday morning, um, <clears throat> We got the call that she passed away, and uh, I thought I owed it to her to at least try. So you called? Yeah, that's why I called. Wow. More out of fidelity to his dying sister than any kind of hope, Dan called the OLG and left a message. Hello, my name is Daniel Campbell. I'm calling to put a claim in on uh, the Super 7 prize. That I saw the, the call back came from the OPP, the police. What did you think? Did you think this had something to do with the ticket, or did you think no, you I were... No, I thought I was in trouble for something. 
but uh, you yeah. had a guilty conscience. <laughs> <laughs> Always do. But yeah, they just uh, they had asked me to come in for an interview and made arrangements to go go in the next day, and that's what we did. It would be the first of many meetings with the cops. Tell me about the interview. Um, they just asked me questions, like obviously where I worked and um, where I lived, the relationship between St. Catharines and Burlington, and my buying habits, where I'd buy tickets, when I'd buy tickets, just that type of thing. These guys were looking for certain answers, right? Yeah. Did you realize that at the time, that no. this was a test? No, I didn't. <laughs> Well, it looks like this customer is in one location quite a bit if I look at all the green markings here. The investigators even knew well before the police contacted Dan where the rightful owner bought most of his tickets over years he'd played the lotto game, across the street from Dan Campbell's house in St. Catharines. So this is a pretty convenient spot if you're gonna play the... Very convenient. <laughs> That's the store right over there? Yep, right there. And that was the big uh, clue, I guess. That was pretty definitive. Um, from my understanding, yeah. yeah. I bought tickets at a lot of places, but that was the, the primary right. location of where I'd get them. Mm -hmm. But for them, uh, a, a bell went off when you mentioned the address. Yeah, yeah, they, they had told me that later. Eventually, the police took Dan on a tour through southern Ontario. Avondale right here on your left. They just s told me, show me where you bought tickets. And they did. And you remembered? Yeah. See, this is like more than seven years yeah. after. Yeah. Because <laughs> you remembered everything. I still can't believe it that I did. <laughs> I forget what I had for breakfast most days. <laughs> But what a memory he had for lotto purchases. In 2003, he'd been working on construction all over the place, and the cops knew exactly where the rightful winner had been buying tickets. A lot of them were uh, next to Tim Hortons, because we'd stop for coffee, and the one guy would go get the coffee, I'd go to the convenience store next door, or the gas station, and pick up a couple tickets. The tour went on for two days. Dan was able to get employment records from his boss for 2003. That clinched it for the cops. But they had a warning. He mustn't tell a soul, not even the friends who'd shared the ticket. When we were finished, we were heading back, and uh, I'd asked them, I said, well, how am I doing in comparison to, to other people you've interviewed? And they said, uh, you're 100%. And I said, well, is anyone close? And they said, I think the next closest person might be get 10%. So then it, I, I had a pretty good, good idea that, uh, that this was going to turn out well for us. When we come back, the payday of a lifetime. Cheers, boys! Hey, boys. Millionaires. Hey. Dan Campbell was unemployed and flat broke. He needed a loan, but he was also bursting to tell someone what was going on. So he called Jim Riemann, one of the six other guys he'd been buying for. We sat down and I asked him if I could borrow some money, because <laughs> I didn't have any. Um, I asked him for 3,000, he says 2,500, but it was 3,000, don't, uh, don't let him lie to you. He asked when I was gonna pay him back, and I said, well, I'm not going to pay you back. And then he started getting a little upset. <laughs> and who wouldn't? He wants to borrow money and doesn't plan to pay it back? Jim knew his buddy Dan had a quirky sense of humor, and he knew that Dan was broke. What he didn't know was that Dan had a secret. Those meetings with the OPP, the likelihood that he and Jim and five of their best pals were about to become millionaires. Dan wasn't supposed to tell, not even them, but the temptation and his need for a loan became too much. Well, then he tells you what's up. 
Didn't believe him. You didn't believe him? No. Well, actually, when he told me that, he said that the ticket was ours. Um, I said to him, I says, oh, well, all right, then let me run to the ATM machine and get you your money. And then I laughed. <laughs> and then another 10, 15 minutes after trying to convince him, still didn't believe me. So I'd called uh, one of the investigating officers because I told her that I was going <laughs> to try and borrow money off Jim. So if he didn't believe me, I'd call her. And um, that's what I had to do. Okay. She gave me her badge number and her, all the stuff, all the information over the phone and said it was our ticket. Of course, I didn't believe her. I actually, I believe I said, uh, okay, so uh, this is Dan's mom. <laughs> and we were playing a joke on him, but eventually uh, he came to believe me. Did and he did lend me the money. And did you pay it back? Yes, he made me pay it back too. Soon, all seven were celebrating. But still, it had to be a secret from everybody else. It was to be a rare good news story for the OLG, still reeling from past controversy over fraud. You couldn't buy PR like this. Seven ordinary Joes redeemed by diligence and ingenuity. Joe Riemann, millionaire. The way it happened was kind of, it was kind of cool. It was a big deal when everybody found out. They, uh, they're like, how long did you know? I'm like, for a while. And I had gone to a hockey tournament the weekend before and didn't tell anybody. And they're like, how did you not say anything? I'm like, because until that piece of paper was in my hand, it wasn't true. <laughs> and then on January 27th, 2011, it was all too true. <laughs> This little band of working guys were on the ride of a lifetime, riding in style to collect, after interest, $2.1 million each. What's going on in the limo? A lot of laughing. A lot of yeah. laughing? Mm -hmm. A lot of high fives. A lot of high fives. Yeah. How much money did you have in the limo? Depends uh, if I didn't you have any. <laughs> yeah, I was broke. <laughs> broke, heading for the city, but by now, there is no longer any doubt they'd be going home, full-fledged millionaires. It was a celebration for the winners, but also a magic moment for the sleuths who found them. So I'm trying to imagine that day, you know, at the press conference, and suddenly Dan stands up. You knew Dan for years. <laughs> and he didn't know. He didn't know. How much you knew about him. Yes. It was so nice to finally find these winners and you know to actually go in there and uh, meet it was like i never thought i would see the day what did it mean for you to be in that room it's amazing absolutely amazing uh i was introduced and uh people the wives just going in the room it's just overwhelming and you know you've changed the lives of people that you know we did make a difference our team made a difference you've seen the happiness within the room as you experience that it's really hard to say anything because you're just fighting with your words it's very emotional the celebrity was new and they ate it up every morsel we were more surprised about what olg gave us for uh Free. <laughs> Little loot bag. Yeah. What was in the loot bag? Pens and notepads. Yeah, and five hundred things. <laughs> yeah. like, oh, well, Dan, I'm not going to lie. You scooped some peanut butter and stuff, did you not? Uh, <laughs> I took the jam. <laughs> the jam, I'm sorry. The jam. was using it. They would have thrown it out, so <laughs> I took it home. Couldn't be better, guys. They were like seven guys who were just down-to-earth guys and were about to have a lot of fun. I would have loved to be with them that night. <laughs> I'm the limo. Yeah. <laughs> All right, you got knocked oh, oh, yeah. dude. Winning with interest close to $15 million can make a fella thirsty. So first stop after all the hoopla at the OLG, a liquor store. This would be a party they could all afford. Cheers, boys! Yeah, boys. Yeah, yeah. A day of memories to last forever, even if the money doesn't. 
After years denied their winnings, a surprising lack of rancor, they're even grateful in a way. Millionaires Mike Maddox and Dan McGregor. Ever cross your mind that you got ripped off a bit? You know, this was delayed by that much time. I was actually kind of glad it happened seven years later. Me too. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I was yeah. in a different spot in my life. Yeah, well, no well, kids. More, more mature right yeah. now. And different priorities. Yeah. So you t seven, eight, nine, ten years ago. Would have been in Vegas blowing a whole lot of money probably. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh... Winning this way was a blast, a thriller. As for the money, a $2 million windfall wasn't going to change these guys. So Dan, what's your big thrill, the biggest thrill? What was the moment that will always stick in your mind? After, after uh, we got the money, I went over to uh, Tops in uh, <laughs> Niagara Falls, New York, and I got a gallon of milk for a buck. <laughs> That, to me, was exciting. <laughs> I, I grabbed five or six of them. I have a picture somewhere. That, that was exciting. I was really excited about that. They're probably still on your counter, though. Hi, are you Kathleen? When we come back, money on the run. I'm with the CBC. I'm not interested anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm done with this. It's just too much. We don't, I don't want to go through this again. So let's go back to the beginning. Dan Campbell bought lotto tickets in St. Catharines in December 2003 for himself and his six blue-collar buddies. Thank you. Days later, he checked his tickets at Variety Plus in Burlington, where Kenneth and Jun Chul Chung worked. This is where the story gets murky and legal. Certain things we aren't allowed to tell you because the courts won't let us. We can tell you that Dan Campbell won a free play ticket and that this free ticket won 12 and a half million bucks on Boxing Day 2003. And that Kathleen Chung, whose brother and father ran the store where Dan Campbell checked his ticket, eventually collected the prize. The police believe her father and her brother frequently stole tickets from their customers and it finally paid off when they stole Dan's. Kathleen Chung's claim that it was hers is bogus, according to the OLG. Remember the DART system for tracking tickets? OLG investigators concluded only one person could have bought that ticket, Dan Campbell. The mystery is still unfolding. Just how did the Chung's end up with the winning ticket? But what they did with the 12 and a half million bucks is less mysterious. The Lottery Corporation is now suing to get it back, which might not be quite as easy as it sounds. Forensic accountant, Peter McFarlane. Where the complexity comes from is in the, the volume of transactions and, and the period of time over which it occurred. According to documents filed for the OLG lawsuit, which has yet to be contested, the family stashed the money in more than 20 bank accounts in the names of individuals and companies and trusts, and there was residential and commercial property and lots of luxuries. The documents also say that Chung's at some point moved part of the prize money to a bank in South Korea. From their perspective, whether they feel that uh, they were entitled to that money uh, or not, uh, they may have felt uh, that that money was under threat and if things didn't go their way uh, perhaps they would need to take precautions to make sure that they could retain some some of the funds in percentage terms what are the chances that the olg is going to get some or any significant amount of that money back i would uh, slim to none to getting it all back if the proceeds went to korea lots of luck getting them back Assuming that uh, there was no cooperation from uh, uh, the, the people that had transferred the money, it's uh, quite a complex and costly process to try and retrieve that, that money. 
For their part, the Chung's deny that they did anything wrong and are waiting for a chance to plead their case. Kathleen Chung, who cashed the winning ticket, has an added wrinkle in her defense. If, in fact, her father or her brother stole the ticket, she didn't know it and cashed it in honestly believing that they got it fair and square. Obviously, we wanted to get their side of the story, but they're not talking. The most they've said publicly was what I managed to get out of Kathleen when we tracked her down in 2007. Hi, are you Kathleen? Yes. Hi, my name is Lyndon. Yes. I'm with the CBC. Yes. And uh, we wanted to have a, an interview with you. I'm not interested anymore. I, I'm, I'm done with this. It's just too much. We don't, I don't want to go through this again. Just no uh, more. What have you gone through? <laughs> just, I don't want to be hassled. I don't, I don't want to be do, bothered. This is not really a hassle. I don't want to discuss anything further. So I'm finished you... with everything. I'm living my life, I'm happy. Whether she wants to or not, she'll be discussing her hassle sooner or later in a civil lawsuit filed by the OLG and possibly a trial on charges of fraud and money laundering filed against her, her brother, and her father. with unexpected, unearned money will buy expensive toys. It's what you do. At least two of these big boys are no exception. Well, it took you long enough to get here. We left at the same time. Well, you heard me coming. <laughs> two guys behind you bought big muscle cars. Two single guys bought muscle cars. <laughs> <laughs> the guys who were married had to buy their wives' cars, too. That's so right. they weren't muscle cars. <laughs> Uh, I, the first thing I bought was uh, a brand new Explorer for her. And then I ordered my truck and we bought a house. Becoming millionaires changed their lives a little bit. Not near as much as people like them think when it's just a dream. They still buy tickets, <laughs> get up and go to work each day. It's a little different when you get to walk into work. If you don't have to be there, you want to be there, but you don't have to be there. It gives you a little different outlook on life. You know, I go to work because I want to go to work, not because I have to go to work. It's a nice option to have. If the money bought them anything of value, it's a certain liberation from uncertainty. Well, my wife, she was pregnant at the time so with our second child, so that was a, a big relief off my shoulders. A lot of money went to helping yeah, family and stuff nice like that. So that was a good to help We liked family. it. It was, it was nice yeah. to give my in-laws and my dad and brother, sister-in-law, everything. So it was, that was nice. I liked doing that. And it's also how they won. That their story leaves a legacy that for them is almost more important than the money. Almost. Because of our story, like, it will never happen again, and people are protected now from uh, anything like this happen again. I think I'm more proud of that than anything, that uh, it won't happen to anybody else. At the OLG, they hope he's right. Of the tens of millions the ombudsman reported lost to fraud, there's little hope of getting much, if any, of it back. If, if I was going to beat you up in an interview, I'd say, you know what? The OLG screwed up once. It, the wrong people got a ticket. Uh, how am I to know you're not going to screw up again? You would say what? I would say we followed best practices back then. And I look at technology today. And just on generally of technology overall, this will never happen again. You're not a bit nervous making a broad claim like that? Our capabilities and the fact that anything over $10,000 or anything deemed suspicious goes over to the Ontario Provincial Police. We've come a long way. So you will find the person who bought the ticket and validated the ticket no matter how hard they try to conceal? That's right. You're pretty confident? I'm pretty confident. Remember Bob Edmonds? His story ended happily, but also sadly. He got his money, but he died shortly afterwards. He's sure remembered at the OLG, he's the guy who really woke them up. 
first exposed a major weakness in the system, the potential for deceit by people who sell lotto tickets. It's a measure of how far they've come in the past six years that the man who once starred in their worst nightmare now seems to be their patron saint. The Chung case will play out before the courts, but the real test will be the effort to get back the $12.5 million the OLG claims the family got through fraud. An exercise that, according to experts in such matters, could cost more than the value of the cash and assets they might eventually recover.